Welcome. Uh, thank you for attending the Dispelling Gen Z Myths session with Dr. Julia Judy Johnson. Um, I am Brent Anderson with ODK staff. I uh, am serving as the moderator. So what we'll do, this is a live stream. So any communication will be done through the chat box. So please make your comments there. If it's something important, I'll, I'll interrupt and, and, and discussion or anything like that will be handled through the chat box. Um, it's now my privilege to introduce our presenter, Dr. Judy Johnson. Now she prefers to be called Dr. JJ. Uh, she was first appointed uh, by Governor Schwarzenegger. Now that's something you can put in your resume there. As the LEP member to the Board of Behavioral Sciences in the state of California, uh, August 2005 to 2008, and was reappointed with Governor Brown from 2008 to 2012. So she served about seven years in that position. Uh, she's been in private practice as a licensed educational psychologist for over 25 years, assisting parents, community agencies, universities and school districts with educational planning. Uh, Dr. JJ is currently an, an associate professor at Azusa Pacific University in school counseling and school psychology. She has previously been on faculty with the University of Redlands in, in uh, the in master's program in educational of education school counseling program, Mount St. Mary's College in Los Angeles and California State Polytechnic University. She has been a school psychologist in districts throughout the state of California, serving as an educational coordinator for counseling programs and supervisors for counseling interns in multiple mental health disciplines. Dr. JJ is a board member of Lift Renewal Ministries, a private nonprofit organization that promotes leadership development within the communities throughout the world, as well as the the Dibble Institute, a nonprofit that promotes healthy relationship in youth. Dr. JJ married her college sweetheart 42 years ago after meeting at the University of Redlands cross country track team there. She's still an avid runner, while other favorite hobbies include skiing, tennis, golf, and chasing her grandchildren. Good thing she's a good runner around the Oregon coast. I now turn the time over to Dr. JJ. Thank you, Brent for that wonderful introduction. I wanted to mention University of Redlands. That was my shout out to my ODK circle. Cool. So not many of us on the West Coast, I don't think represented in this conference. So I'm really thankful to have this opportunity. So I wanted to start a little bit by talking about educational justice because this is dispelling Gen Z myths and then creating ed justice circles, EJ circles. So what is educational justice? Educational justice is what I got my doctorate in actually at the University of Redlands. And part of the cohort there decided that we were the very first cohort this side of the Mississippi in educational justice. And so part of our pledge was to include that in anything that we did going forth. So needing to be faithful to understand what that is as we dispel generational myths, as we create circles of trust for people, Educational justice is simply saying everybody needs to have access to whatever resources they need to be successful, to thrive in an educational system. And that doesn't mean we all need the same thing. It means we need the resources we need to be able to, to get to the next step, whatever that might be for us to promote healthy living and to be successful and to not just survive, but to thrive. So when we talk about ed justice, we talk about isms because usually that's in terms of discrimination. So those would be things like, like uh, racism, culturalism, classism, institutionalism, sizeism, ageism, ableism, which includes disabilities, but it would also include ableism in terms of being discriminated against for being a gifted student also in the system. So that's ableism culturalism um, and entitlement and so and sexism and we talk about sexism now especially with gender fluidity um, that's heterosexism it's a lot of different things so what I wanted to do was start by showing you here a uh, video clip because people will say what can I do about it so I see these things, I understand these things, what can I do about it? 
So here's a video clip from Joy DeGruy. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white. Hey, Blue you, eyes, yeah, white and the screen. Very white. Sorry. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins. And we, you know, it's the wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. Sorry, folks. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law, is in front of me. And she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her groceries. Now, my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me. And I was directly behind her you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how you doing? This is a nice day today. They're just chatting up and she says, yeah. So Kathy writes her, her check and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up, no conversation. She looks up at me, absolutely no, just a little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, is 10, notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check and she goes, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. At which point my daughter looks at me and she gets very, very embarrassed and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye like, mommy, you're not going to, you're not going to let her do this. Why is she doing this to us? Right? So I'm trying to figure out what I should do because behind me are two elderly white women right and I'm thinking okay so then I become the angry black woman right and they're gonna be and I just I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama so then I I just give her the two pieces of ID yes you know some things you got to choose your battles right and then it gets worse she pulls out the bad check book right so the, the this is the book that shows the people who've written bad checks so she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating. Now my, my daughter is in full-blown emotionally upset, who's 10. My sister-in-law walks back over and she steps in and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well, I know you, you've been, she goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. It is totally unacceptable. At which point the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair. Why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. Okay. So what can you do? People often ask. Um, I want you to think for a moment, everybody, because this is always very powerful. Think for a moment about your own experiences because the best empowerment that we can get is from recognizing those things that we've experienced ourselves we've walked down that road so even though we all look different and we come from different generations where was it that you experienced some sense of educational injustice or discrimination again as i mentioned think about in your own past in your educational journey we're all people that um, whether we're college students or we're faculty we're all people that have had at least 13 years of um, institutional education. So where in those moments have you been discriminated against? Racism, classism, culturalism, entitlement. Um, and again, even if that's discrimination against a religion or a faith, that's a form of, of culturalism. Classism, sexism. Where have you had those moments where somebody stepped in for you? Or were you the person that stepped in for somebody else? Or 
now that you're older, you look back on an experience you had in school with a teacher or somebody as a child and you say, you know what, I do something differently now. So that's what understanding what, what educational justice is. Now, when I look at the generational differences and I say, and I just, I love using this illustration. I have a friend named Ellen and um, so I'm, I'm a boomer, right? So she's my age, I'm 62, full disclosure. Um, and she's got these two kids that are millennials. And um, so her friends, you know, she moved to a new community, Napomo, Central California. When I was teaching at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Obispo I lived on the Central Coast. And there was a, a brand new high school, brand new community. And her kids were telling her all about all the new friends they had made. And one of them was they had equestrian and agriculture. So her daughter, Brenna, who is a, an 11th grader, you know, had made this new friend who was doing equestrian work with her. She actually wanted to be a therapist uh, using horses, an equestrian therapist. So that was where she was studying. And then her son, um, Derek, you know, was in um, band. And so he had a friend in band in the horn section with him. So she heard all about these new friends. And she said, you know, at some point you got, you know, invite them over, invite them over. So one day she's, you know, they had this barbecue and they invited both of their friends over. And she said, it was then I realized, and I didn't even know it because they'd never mentioned it to me, that both of their best friends came from different racial and cultural groups, right? So Brenna's best friend was this African-American girl, lovely person. And Derek's best friend was this Asian child, Asian kid, Asian youth. And she said, you know, all of a sudden it hit me they were telling me all about their best friends. I knew all about their personality. I knew all about what they loved to do. I knew all about them as people. I knew why they bonded with them as best friends, which was so fabulous. And I thought, how glorious is this? Look at how far we've come. That we don't even mention what race they are. My kids, my millennial kids, are so much more forward thinking and progressive than I was growing up that we don't even mention that. And she was saying, you know, when it was my generation, Growing up as a as a boomer, it was all about: um, Are you sure that it's okay that we have different, you know, religious affiliations? So, well, I don't know. I'm inviting somebody over. Is it okay, mom, if they're Jewish? Is it okay if they're Baptist? Is it okay if they're Catholic? There was always an assumption that there was a church or a place they attended, but was that okay? And she says, and when I think about the previous generation for my parents' generation, it was about what was different was oh. Um, are they from a different neighborhood? Do they, it's a different SES, socioeconomic status. Do they come from, do the kids go to the same school? Are they from the same neighborhood? That for them was the important way of saying we have the same class. So as we look at classism, or if we look at culturalism with re re religious affiliations for the, for the, uh, for the uh, boomer generation or Gen Xers, as we look at, um, race for the millennials. I'm saying for the Gen Z kids, it's all about gender equality and gender fluidity. And that's something that they don't really care about. And so now as we're working with kids from Gen Z, it's not about um, he, she, or they. You know, call somebody by their first name. Um, it's about understanding for Gen Z that that's who they are. And that's just a label. And we need to just dispel those labels because those labels get in the way of us truly understanding um, who we are. So I wanted to play for you again, and I will share my screen, I promise, um, this other clip, which is just a very basic understanding right now from Time Magazine when we look at what is Gen Z? and understanding who Gen Z is. So it's a very quick distinction. When you become a new parent, the world looks different. Some Once we get past- Lady, you're comfort conscious, but also yeah. more mothers. Okay. Generations are really about cultural change. By studying generations, we can get an idea of how growing up now as a child or a teen is different from it was for, say, the Gen Xers growing up in the 80s or the boomers growing up in the 1960s. Uh, 
uh, looking specifically at numbers, we define Gen Z as those born between 1995 and 2012. 1995 just happens to be the year the internet was commercialized. So that also captures the generation of people who were born um, after the internet existed, who don't know a world without the internet. But compared to previous generations, they spend a lot more time communicating with their friends electronically. And they also spend less time hanging out with their friends in person. In my generation, we're truly digital natives. We've really only known a world where our phones are smart. You know, we turn to technology for a lot of things, whether it be entertainment, research, education. It's truly just part of who we are. I'm not entirely convinced that iGen's uh, skill with social media is going to be a complete positive. It's also linked to depression and anxiety and unhappiness especially for people who are spending too much time on social media, who are comparing themselves to others too much. You know, people always talk about taking digital detoxes and stepping away for a little bit. And I don't know if it's necessarily cutting out the phone for a month at a time, but understanding that it's okay to put down your phone for a couple hours, don't have it at the dinner table, try not to be on your phone right before bed. There's just time and a place for everything. And I think understanding that is really important. I think something that parents can do to help with this anxiety, the phones and information overload is really helping them sort of analyze and prioritize the information is what we find is something that's definitely needed with this generation. At the moment, uh, what many people think of when they think of iGen is a teen or a young adult, you know, looking at his or her phone. Um, but I think they'll become known for other things as time goes on. One of our traits that, you know, is very upfront with my generation is that we're very, very realistic. At a young age, we were thrown into a world that you could say wasn't the prettiest. You know, we grew up amongst the 2009 recession after 9-11, and our parents didn't tell us we could necessarily be whatever we wanted. They told us that it's a hard world out there. You're going to have to work your butt off, and if you're not willing to, there's plenty of others that will. Gen Z entering the workforce, it's going to be a lot of change. For Gen Z, if I can log on and log in, I'm at work. So I think the physical office is really going to be challenged. Another thing that we know about this generation that are really going to challenge is the pace at which things get done. Everyone talks about work-life balance. You know, I got my work and my life and works from nine to five and then your life and how do we balance the two? What I love about Gen Z is they just don't think it works and it really hasn't worked. What they go for is work-life blend where work and life are seven days a week, 24 hours a day. By spring of their senior year, iGen teens are less likely, compared to previous generations, to have their driver's license, to work at a paid job, to go out on dates, to drink alcohol. And we've already seen this with millennials in young adulthood, taking longer to settle into careers, to marry, to have children, uh, and so on. So the whole developmental trajectory is slowed down. Gen Z is by far the most diverse generation ever, and we're also the most interconnected around the globe. And part of the reason is, you know, now with our generation, when something happens, the entire world finds out immediately through social media, through hashtags. We're always connected to each other. So we're, we feel as though whether it happened in the same building or a thousand miles away, it is in immediately affecting us because we hear about it. And so there we feel obligated to help and be a part of the situation, whether it's positive or negative. They are also the one that values equality the most, whether we're talking about race or gender or sexual orientation or transgender issues. Um, they're really much more open um, and focused on equality. We really do not fear failure. So whether it be through political activation or entering a new workplace or trying new things, we're willing to try something and fail. And this is going to have a great impact on the other generations. For the rest of us who have been so cautious, that's going to really rub off to get us to step outside our box and maybe try some new things. Okay. So let's look a little bit then. When we talk about what Gen Z is, what Gen Z isn't, um, and dispelling some of those myths, so you heard them talk about um, that they tend to be considered as uh, selfish at times. And I think when we look at a Gen Z myth saying, oh, well, they're self-centered because they're so self-absorbed all the time in their phone, in their box, in their own little world. They're not aware of what's going on around them. But in reality, they're entrepreneurial, they're progressive, they're individualistic. And um, what is different about that? Well. Their parents, who tend to be boomers or millennials, were people that uh, met in groups for social change. So for them, social change was important, but it was done outside of the house, outside of a box, outside of a, a digital connection. Remember, they're the first digital natives. 
So it was always important for previous generations to go out into the neighborhood or then to even um, gather and gather in places like, you know, institutions. And so Gen Z distrusts institutions and institutionalization. And, you know, I think for a good reason, because there's a lot to distrust there. So in terms of political parties, um, public school systems and all of these affiliations, they're not as entrusted in those things as previous generations. We have the largest group of people right now that are not claiming a political affiliation. They vote for a candidate, they vote for an issue, they don't vote party, party line, which is very different. We also have the largest group of people now ever that are not affiliating um, with a specific a, a church institution or religious group. So there's a church membership decline and that decline has been steady. And the 20, the Fetzer Institute came out with research in 2020, which is pretty recent. Eight in 10 Gen Z people consider themselves spiritual, but are not associated um, with a specific religious institution or a church. So they believe in a higher authority. They believe in God, they believe in a spiritual manifestation of something greater than themselves, they believe in a creator, but they do not go and attend and have membership in a specific church or affiliation. They don't have a membership in a political party. They don't necessarily also at this point um, completely trust the public school system. And I'm looking at where we are right now with COVID and we can't even tell you how things are gonna be continuing to change. But Gen Z students are also those people in this generation that are, have been brought up by parents that are more homeschooled, um, have alternative settings, are doing online teaching and online learning. So all of that in terms of membership and institutionalization has also changed. So those are some facts about Gen Z. Um, but why, why are these good things as well? Mistrusting these things have made them independent, progressive. It's not that they don't embrace God and spirituality. As parents feel, oh no, they're not going to church, they've lost their religion. Um, you know, well, maybe it's a different form of spirituality. And so what they do is they open themselves up and they look at more uh, global issues. And they look at spirituality as something that has um, larger implications for embracing global issues and customs and cultures and having an impact on a greater level. Let's look at a second myth. The second myth is um, that they are developmentally, socially, emotionally immature. You heard Jean Twangy, who was the authority on that uh, videotape. She's from San Diego State University. She's written the rather famous book, iGen. Gen Z is also considered iGen, they're the internet generation. Um, and in Dr. Twenge's book, you know, she points out, and as she stated in that video, that developmentally, their trajectory is a lot slower than previous generations. Well, um, just because they're doing things differently, right? The driver's license, the dating, the marriage, um, these things are just taking longer we're looking at that and saying, um, oh, they're fearful. Well, in reality, um, it's the previous generation that was more fearful, okay? The millennials were the ones that started this trajectory for Gen Z and the Gen Z people are now just responding to that actually. So for the millennials, um, there was this thing called fragility, right? And fragility means it was safetyism. And the concern there is parents saying to them, be careful, it's dangerous out there, you have to be safe. And so we raised a generation of kids that were more millennials that were saying, it's not safe to go out of my neighborhood. Um, the federal education policies around that were called no child left behind. And they were all raised on kind of group think. There's a right answer, you have to check C. If you don't know the answer to multiple choice, check C, that's your best bet. This is the script, this is the test. My teacher and I get rewarded. We even get monetary reward from a lot of states under No Child Left Behind. If I get my test answers correct, it was all about teaching to the test. Gen Z came along, we made it ESSA. Thank you, Obama. Every Student Succeeds Act. And under the Every Student Succeeds Act, there's things like school culture and school climate. And we actually have these in the Federal Government Act now for education. 
people need to be accepted for who they are, gender equality, um, understanding that uh, people look different and are different, but it's not a one size fits all. It's not vanilla, right? It's rainbow, the ice cream. So those are the differences that have come about because the millennials had that safetyism and that fear. The Gen Z students are the ones that then embrace courage, curiosity, wonder. So another example of this, right? Um, Gen Z are those people right now that were born between 95 and 2012, 1995, 2012, currently age nine to age 26. So I have a student, um, I teach in the psychology department at Azusa Pacific University School Psychology School Counseling. I have a school counseling student in the master's program who has children. And so, but she's a Gen Zer. Okay, so she's like 25. And, um, you know, she's got a six year old. She married young, she had a child young. She has a six year old. And she said, you know, he wanted to get on the bus. These are games we do. So he wanted to get on the bus and he wanted to go exploring. And she said, you know, I was brought up with safetyism. I was brought up with I'm fragile. I was brought up with careful lock the door, come in before dark because they're, the boogeyman might hurt you. I was brought up with watching car crashes on the freeway all day long because my parents were watching that on the TV, which instilled this constant sense of, oh God, it's not safe out there. But I didn't want that for my kid, right? I'm not that generation, I'm Gen Z. I brought my kid up on, you know what? It's okay to go out there. It's really not that bad because if I look and see all the statistics and I read them for myself, we're actually the safest generation we've had since the 1970s and this is true. The statistics, the crime statistics show as a world we're a safer place than we were in the 70s. But it's the media that feeds this fear to us, right? So her kid said, I want to go on the bus and I want to go get ice cream because I see people riding the bus and it's a really cool thing. And she said, that sounds terrific. And he goes, I want to go by myself. So this is where most parents would pull their hair out and freak. And she said, I'm going to give you a map and let's make a game out of it and we're going to have fun. And she gave him a map and showed him exactly where to go. And not only that, where was his map? Well, of course his map was on his phone. And of course they had internet connection. Of course they were talking to each other digitally. Of course her phone was connected to his phone. Everywhere he needed to go, they were constantly interacting with one another, but he got on the bus by himself, but with his digital partner, with his parent, and rode to get ice cream, and then rode to another place to go pick up chocolate, and then came back from the chocolate store, came back from the ice cream store, came back, but, the difference is she gave him a note that was written with her signature on it that said, this is my son, here's my phone number, this is where I am, he's located with me on the phone. If there's a problem and you think that he he's not hasn't been given permission, please give me a call. That's how Gen Z thinks, right? It's very different. So let's look at a third uh, myth. A third Gen Z myth is that um, they do not have an inner voice or an inner teacher. Um, they don't have a sense of, of personal agency. So when you think about a sense of personal agency or an inner voice or an inner teacher, those are the things that we get concerned about because we look at them and we say they're socially isolated. They're spending way too much time on their digital devices. It's true the statistics are, are up there that they are possibly more depressed more suicidal, more isolated, more lonely. But if we're living in the middle of a digital world, that's not just a generational thing. All of us that have been socially isolated, regardless of your age or your generation, are more lonely and socially isolated because we don't choose to take digital breaks, which is a challenge for everybody. When you look at this generation and we say, you don't have a sense of personal agency, this is not true. Personal transformation always precedes social transformation. The difference is previous generations have been so self-absorbed with figuring out who they are and what the meaning of their life is and where they can fit in, where they can notch on the wall, where they can make their mark, where they can have their legacy. Legacy was the millennial word. And so they're so busy looking to see where their meaning can be and what their purpose in life is that that's where they, they're good, they're good with that. And not that that's not a worthy thing, that's wonderful. But this generation, Gen Z, looks at it differently. 
they say, so I've got personal agency and an inner voice, but my inner voice is screaming out. My inner voice is saying, this world is messed up. Remember you heard him say he was, uh, the gentleman that was speaking in the video said that they were born, you know, uh, with 9-11 and um, the recession and they're realistic. They're realistic. They're competitive. It's not just I showed up. I deserve the flowers. Give me the gold ring. I'm, I've got a selfie and I'm ready to go. They show up and they say it's a tough world out there and I know it. But I also know that I want to do something else with that personal sense of agency I want social transformation after my personal transformation. So they're taking it a step further now and they're saying it's global because it's a global neighborhood and they wanna be socially connected. So they wanna make a difference. So they're big, about, they're big on civic action, just the way the busters and the boomers, they wanna go out and do things. But it seems like this generation is connecting more with the generation of the boomers than they were with Gen Xers or millennials. This is how the cycle's working. And it seems like this generation has more in common with maybe their grandparents and saying, you know what, you guys did Hey Dashbury, you guys did Woodstock, we've got the Coachella Festival. Not only do we have the Coachella Festival, we got Black Lives Matter, we're going out on the street. And we're putting boots to our words. We're not just talking the talk like we think previous generations have done, we're walking the walk now. So this is the difference. And when we say, oh, they're not as spiritual and they don't have faith and they're not going to church and what's going to happen. This is where they say, you know what? We're not going to church because we're not sitting in the pew listening to the sermon. I'm getting what I need online, which is fine, but I'm getting it from a lot of different faith traditions. I'm looking at Eastern as well as Western. I'm looking at global traditions. I'm looking at indigenous people and what they do. I'm looking at the climate and the world and all these important things that creator higher authority has given to us. And yes, um, if I'm believing in it in a different way, I'm believing in it in action. I'm here in the part of the gospel that says, go forth and treat your neighbor as yourself. That's what I'm hearing. And I'm hearing that part of the gospel that says, make a difference. Uh, greet people, greet people as aliens in your land because you once were aliens in this land, i.e. none of us are aliens, we're all neighbors. So when you look at that, per, those particular um, myths that we want to dispel, and I do want to mention this whole idea of sending your kids out, being courageous, being curious, embracing wonder. We are now officially calling that the rewilding movement, which I love because it used to be, again, uh, kids would, I grew up running around outside, skinning my knee, climbing a tree. Then we had this generation of safetyism where everything was prescribed. You go to this camp, there's not a minute left on my schedule where I'm not going to a camp or a program. It's supervised, it's structured, it's organized. I don't have to think, I don't have to have a creative thought. And it's really scary being out after dark. Now we're training our kids in Gen Z to rewild, rewild, go out and explore, be in a park, be a survivalist, figure out what you need to do get in touch with the, and the climate and the creation. So those are all part of the, um, the myths that we wanna talk about dispelling. I'm gonna move on to my PowerPoint. I uh, gave you a PowerPoint previously and then I um, revised it. So this PowerPoint will be available and hopefully we can get that to you um, through ODK. Brent can find a way to get that to you. Let me share my screen. Um, and if not, obviously we're gonna put my email address in the chat and I can get you anything in terms of PowerPoint, but also um, I will have PDFs available in terms of creating educational justice circles. So I wanna move now a little bit into what does that look like? Um, and we're gonna call them leadership clarity circles. So here's just, and I wanna buzz through this so we can get to some good things. I wanna make sure I don't uh, run out of time, but um, Thomas Merton, you do not need to know precisely what is happening or exactly where it's all going. What you need is to recognize the possibility and the challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with courage, faith, and hope. This is what I hear Gen Z saying. 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Don't be so afraid. Jump out there. Be courageous. Be bold. Make mistakes. It's okay. Um, the last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitudes. Okay. So we must learn to measure our efforts not by short-term effectiveness, but by long-term faithfulness to the vision that we are about. So what I want to now show you is a little bit of um, the clearness committee. And I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, pop this up if I can and show you a little bit of Parker Palmer. Parker Palmer is part of the um, Institute for Courage and Renewal. Sorry, let me pop this up here and I'm going to see if I can actually get him up here. Okay. So the Institute for Courage, Courage and Renewal is uh, uh, Parker Palmer, who's from a Quaker tradition. And uh, part of his Quaker tradition was to create circles of trust. Um, my educational justice circles that I've created have been influenced by this. Let me share this. This is one of the influences, as well as all of my influences from my um, educational justice doctorate and my own circles that I created as part of my dissertation that I still use today. Uh, I do multidisciplinary circles, multi-generational circles, and I include um, educators, professionals, and we do uh, a process that I will explain to you, but I want you to watch the Clearness Committee and its explanation. We have all kinds of sacred questions inside of us. What's the meaning of our lives? What's the purpose of our lives? What about death? What, all these deep questions of meaning. And so it, it seems to me that that every wisdom tradition that I know anything about, East and West, um, is, is in the first instance, a way of knowing that invites us into, into understanding the unity of all things and learning about how to, how to integrate ourselves more deeply into the unity that we are and the unity that's all around us, the oneness. And, and every wisdom tradition gives us practices that help that happen, that help us claim wholeness. The, the Clearness Committee is a practice invented in the middle of the 17th century by the early Quakers, who believed deeply, as, as I believe, that every person has an inner teacher. A source of inner truth, which for me is the same as soul or selfhood or identity and integrity. And the question was how how to help people get in touch with that, how to how to open a person's life to hear that inner truth more deeply, because we all know how difficult that is in the noise of the world and in the rush of our lives and, and with our own egos constantly. A small group of people, five or six people, gather for two hours with a person who's got a question that he or she is wrestling with, an issue, a problem, a decision they're trying to make, a discernment they're trying to make. And, and for two full hours, those five or six caring, competent adults operate with a very simple rule. They cannot speak to that so-called focus person, the person with the issue in any other way except to ask an honest, open question. It, it sounds simple, but if you imagine not only the length of time involved, two hours, but, but what's involved in asking honest, open questions, which turns out to be very challenging and very demanding. Have you thought about seeing a therapist is not an honest, open question. It, 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 it represents all, the kind of question we like to ask, which is sort of uh, has built in advice. We ask a question as if we 
at a question when in fact we're trying to advise someone. And the purpose of this process is to lay all of our advice aside, all of our wisdom, all of our guidance, all of our thoughts about what this person ought to do, and to create a space that's to be occupied by that person and that person alone to listen as closely as possible to his or her inner teacher, aided by questions that strip away whatever obstacles may lie between my ears and my truth. I feel a huge sense of responsibility about this. I always have and I always will. I feel fierce about it because I'm the person who has said to several people, in this case, including myself, we're going to create a space for here and a space here in which your soul will be safe. I've offered that as a promissory note. And I take that very seriously. I, I've been around the human potential movement too long and I've seen too many people wounded, even though safety was promised. They were invaded, exploited, manipulated. I do not want that to happen on my watch. Period. Amen. And so I want to put this in such a way that you get a little scared about your responsibility, right? because you should be. Not so scared you're paralyzed and not able to do it, but aware that we are suspending the normal rules of social discourse in a very profound way and inviting you into an, a parallel universe, an alternate reality. The, the core of that alternate reality is very simple. It is the conviction that this person has an inner teacher, has wisdom and truth within herself or himself, does not need at this moment in time, our wisdom, our inner teacher, our guidance, instead needs access to that, that voice within, which as we all know, gets obscured and blocked by all kinds of things, external static, internal static. But we can in two hours this morning create a quiet space with those honest open questions that help people remove whatever it is that stands between their awareness and their inner teacher. The Clearness Committee is in a lot of ways a microcosm of the whole circle of trust process. And when you, when we ask people, as we've been doing for more than a decade now, of all the things we did in a circle of trust, the working with poetry, the silence, the journaling, the small groups, what, what, what would you say is the pearl of great price? So many people say it was the clearness committee that, that brought this all home and that really was transformative. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my uh, PowerPoint. And back to sharing my screen. That's a good thing. Okay. And sorry. Go back to sharing my screen. There it is. All right. Here we are. Okay. Um, so in understanding um, the clearness committee, what I wanted to say was so maybe some of those phrases or some of those things that I've been describing in terms of Gen Z, you heard in Parker Palmer's words. Um, they want to be careful about people being safe. They want to protect everybody. And he said that very carefully. He said, people have been abused, people have been hurt, enough of that. Uh, we all have an inner teacher. We all have an inner guide. We all have an inner voice that knows the best about who we are. We have to allow people the grace and the space to be able to access that. Now he talked about a two hour uh, clearness committee. Um, with my educational justice circles, what I've done is I've taken that two hours, and I've actually done a clearness committee before in Circles of Trust that has been 30 minutes. 
uh, and it works really well. Um, so the leadership clarity circles are something where I usually envision it can be done in an hour. Um, and if you have a two hour meeting, you can have a two hour meeting. I've done both, but they can be done effectively in an hour. Um, and, and you start by asking questions like, who are the people in your life that have given you wisdom and then um, and who ask you reflective questions? Who are your guides? So another thing I would like to say about these circles and about Gen Z is, um, as again, as older generations worry about them being isolated or lonely or overwhelmed or not having a sense of self. This is the generation that, as I said, goes into wisdom, into wisdom traditions and understands a, a faith from the ancestors. And they look all around, not just into their immediate religion or their immediate church. They explore and they're not afraid to explore and be curious. And in part of that, what they do, though, is they tap into the ancestors, they tap into traditions, they tap into family traditions, because they have been, the millennials were so lonely and, and desiring those family traditions, again, in that sense of belonging, that Gen Z has now come back and said, I might stay at my house longer with my family, not run away and get married when I'm 20, but I'm really going to spend more time listening to my grandparents. I really want to hear their stories. I want to know their contributions. When I make a contribution, I want to be thoughtful about it and I want it to be valuable. I'm realistic about the world and how much time I've got. And I want, I want to really make a difference for other people. Myself is in social transformation. So listening to the stories of the ancestors, spending time with those, those stories of identity and belonging and heritage, and these are the kinds of things that can happen during an EJ circle and an opportunity to explore for yourself. Who are your guides? Who are the people? Who are the stories? Whether they're in your own family, whether they're things that you've engaged on the Internet, whether it's a practice that you've found that works for you, mindfulness, yoga. Who are those guides for you? The encouragement exercise is a wonderful one. That's where you say to people, okay, I want you to remember when in your life there was a person or a guide or a significant person that, that encouraged you to do something. Why do you do what you love to do today? Think of a hobby. Think of something you really enjoy. Think of a career path. Think of a passion. Who was the person who encouraged you in that one thing and said, you know what? You're pretty good at that. And it might have been a very small moment. It might have not been a family member, you might have had a lot of discouraging voices in your head from other people who said, that's not your job, that's not your gift, that's not your skill. But there was one person who encouraged you, a coach, a mentor, a friend, anybody. And so because of that one voice and that one guide, you've pursued that. We all have that encourager. Um, so, and then there's a stepping stones exercise where you put all of the different places in your life that were transformational and you make a map out of them with stones and on those stones it's a kinesthetic exercise it's fun you get colored pens and pencils you draw okay for people that aren't artistic doesn't matter draw a line with a pen with a number two pencil put circles on it those are your stepping stones deliberately think the places that have been transformational the people that have been transformational and on that stone where you rested for a while and actually gave yourself time to not be hurried, listening to your inner voice, what did you gather from that person on that stone in that place? What wisdom did you gather from them? What did you learn about yourself? What did you learn about life? So these are the touchstones. Um, when he talked about circles of trust, again, these are all things that I include in um, my EJ circles. And he talked about these touchstones, which are incredibly important. And this is a really great chart kind of encapsulating those touchstones. And again, these are things that I see more in this generation. They're coming back to this understanding, okay? The other thing I see in this generation is you saw Parker Palmer's group, um, older people. The last circle of trust, the last group that I attended actually had more 20 and 30 year olds in it. 20 year olds in it than any other group I've ever been in because this generation is really understanding the need to again step out and embrace these really important principles 
These are life-giving values. Give and receive welcome, be present as fully as possible. What is offered in the circle is by invitation, not demand. Don't share if you don't want to share. It's okay to be silent. Speak your truth in ways that respect other people's truth. That's a huge principle for Gen Z. I'm not going to tell you who you are. You know, in the 70s, it was do your own thing. Just don't get any on me. Now it's do your own thing. I'll do my thing. We'll do our thing together while we're whoever we are. And it's wonderful. No fixing, saving, advising, or correcting. This is huge for this generation. Just be. Listen to somebody. Learn to respond with to others with honest, open questions. Don't end statements with periods or exclamation points. Don't end conversations with an end. Always keep it open. And how did that make you feel? And then that took you where? And what have you explored since then? And what did that make you think about? Or I wonder, when the going gets rough, turn to wonder. I wonder, if you feel judgmental or defensive, ask yourself, I wonder what brought them to this belief. Stop. I wonder why they reacted that way. I wonder why they feel that way. Attend to your own inner teacher. Trust and learn from the silence, which is huge. So this generation embraces things and they don't embrace much silence. But that's a world issue, not just this generation. Any of us that have spent way too much time in our digital devices need to trust and learn from the silence. But this generation is not afraid to go there and see what that looks like and feels like. It's different for everybody. Observe deep confidentiality and know that it's possible. These are some resources from EJ Circles. Um, my guides the people that brought me to, to the development of these circles and this creative process. So these, this is like my bibliography um, of why I think this is so important. And then the critical community strength framework um, from Rodriguez was a, a huge influencer for me in terms of working on my ed justice degree and creating these circles, creating them at the University of Redlands and creating these EJ circles now in my living room since 2011. Wow, that's 10 years. That's scary to admit. I've had a group meeting in my living room once a month for 10 years. And yes, we've been Zooming for a year. Once a month. Two hours on a Saturday. The group itself actually can work for about an hour, an hour and a half, but there's gathering. Um, and, and now I, I did it for my doctoral research. I developed this program. I printed it. Um, I got my curriculum. I was done. We'd done it for about eight months. And the people said to me, oh, we're not stopping this process. You think you're done because your dissertation's done and your research is done? <sighs> put the coffee on, put the key under the mat. You do whatever you need to do on Saturday morning once a month, but we're coming here. Then I realized I had something that was actually deeper and was touching people in places that was really important. So this is an incredibly valuable group for us right now. It's like water and oxygen. Um, so these are some of the precepts and the tenets for me and the principles of why it's so important. And here's the framework that was developed. Uh, we want to reframe cultural deficits and not looking at those people that have social influence and social power and social capital, whether they be people with white privilege or people with classism or whatever privilege they have. We don't look at others as having deficits we look at people based on strengths, right? Strengths-based. Um, questioning and dialogue to service potential sources of cultural wealth or assets. So what are people's assets? Where is their cultural wealth? It's coming up in different places that people wouldn't understand. Um, so this just kind of is a framework, uh, like I said, a philosophical framework for where we're coming from. And then the circles themselves, um, you know, when did you first envision that you wanted to be an educational justice leader? Whose voice do you hear every day when you need encouragement to remember your vision? What does that voice say to you? What people in your life have been instrumental in keeping that vision alive? What books, resources, um, websites, right? Anything you can find has been instrumental. People in keeping your vision alive. 
people are resources. Uh, what steps of action did you take this last month, week, today to stay true to your vision? This is the most important part. It's the accountability piece, month to month. So, so here's your vision. This is what the voice is telling you. This is what you want to do. You want to go to that rally. You want to start that program for whatever that might be, um, for underprivileged children, um, you know, to be able to read. You want to help, um, you know, illiterate migrant farm workers. I'm thinking about on the Central Coast where I was in San Luis Obispo. I'm thinking about where I live now in California. We've got a lot of work we're doing with migrant farm workers um, to give them equitable resources and to give them opportunities. Um, so where's your group? Where's your vision? And to have a group to come back and say, it's great to talk about it, but remember this generation is not about talking the talk. They've been talked out. It's about walking the walk. It's about being realistic that it takes baby steps, but we have the resources. We have global partnerships. We're not afraid to ask people to join us because what they find very quickly is when there's a person with an idea, if they're excited about it, you'll know immediately because we're connected, we're interconnected. And the resources that we can get come from the wildest, most extravagant, interesting places, and they can access those resources. So let's be accountable. Uh, where does it come from? Who's telling you? What's compelling you? Who are the people that are now living or dead that are saying this is important and it's a huge, it's a passion for you. It's not just personal transformation, it's social transformation. And then ethical problem solving process. How have your visions, values, and beliefs been congruent with your actions today? And that's our phrase. How have your visions, your vision, your values, and your beliefs that your inner teacher has drawn out of you? How have those been congruent with your actions? This week, today, now, this month, that's where we get real. How can the group specifically hold you accountable until the next meeting? I actually have, looks like I've got two minutes left. I actually have um, this PowerPoint, but if you would like a PDF with the process, I can also send that to you. I'm more than happy to. I'm gonna stop share on this. Um, and I'm gonna look at the chat. Okay, and it says it will cut me off. I understand that, I've got two minutes. So please um, send me, there's my, there's my email. Uh, shoot me an email, I would love to hear from you. If you would like to get these circles started on your campus, I've done these on University of Redlands campus. I'm gonna be getting some going on the Azusa Pacific University campus when we're out of the Zoom room, all of us. Uh, again, I've been doing them from my living room here in uh, Brea, California with educators from all over Orange County and LA County and Riverside County, and one from San Diego County. And I would love to help you get started on this process, whether you're a faculty member or a student. Um, I hope this has been helpful. God bless you, thank you. And it's been an honor and a privilege for me. Please stay in touch. Let me know who you are out there because this is an odd kind of platform and I love to have that interaction and feedback afterwards. Um, and clearly we're not gonna have that opportunity. So I would love to hear from you and um, enjoy the rest of the conference.